Hi everyone, I'm Andrew Bruck, the Acting Attorney General, and welcome to today's virtual event. January is Human Trafficking Awareness Month, and here at the Department of Law and Public Safety, we're joining with law enforcement and community partners to educate residents about these horrific crimes and to discuss ways that we can tackle the root causes of this public health issue. While our law enforcement officers play a critical role in bringing traffickers to justice, we know that prosecution alone cannot end human trafficking. We recognize that anyone can be the victim of trafficking, but it's far more likely if you're poor, if you're a person of color, if you're homeless, or if you've been the victim of violence or abuse. That's why it's so important that we strengthen relationships with social service and healthcare providers and invest in community-based violence prevention and intervention programs. Last year, New Jersey granted millions of dollars to frontline organizations that disrupt cycles of violence and help victims rebuild their lives. And in the years ahead, we'll continue to ensure that essential services are available to those who need them most. Today, you'll hear from Liz Williamson, a survivor and survivor advocate whose story reflects resiliency and strength and underscores the urgent need to carry our efforts forward. This month and every month, we honor those who have stories like Liz, and we acknowledge the countless human trafficking advocates and law enforcement agencies who work hard to defend and protect others from harm. That includes members of the Bergen County Prosecutor's Office, who will receive the Sergeant Noel Hole Award today for their tremendous efforts in bringing traffickers to justice right here in New Jersey. And it certainly includes DCJ Deputy Director Anne-Marie Taggart, who is such a remarkable advocate for trafficking victims and who helped organize today's event. So enjoy the conversations that follow, and I look forward to learning from and collaborating with all of you. Thanks. Welcome to the 12th Annual Human Trafficking Awareness Event. My name is Lindsay Rotolo, and I have the honor of serving as the Director of the Division of Criminal Justice under the leadership of Acting Attorney General Andrew Bruck. At the center of General Bruck's vision for a New Jersey that is safe and just are principles of equity and fairness for justice required when collaborative violence prevention measures fail. As a law enforcement leader, he recognizes that the most effective violence prevention efforts require collaboration across broad segments of our community. New Jersey's approach to combating human trafficking in our state is no different. Our anti-trafficking strategy involves so many vital partners, social service providers, educators and academics, healthcare providers, business leaders, governmental agencies across the state, and local, state, and federal law enforcement. We are so grateful to be joined by so many of our partners here today. This year's event is focused on prevention, specifically on our public health approach to collectively address the root causes of human trafficking. While prosecutors and law enforcement officers will continue to fight for justice for survivors, we know that the threat of criminal prosecution is not enough to deter traffickers. We must also focus on addressing the issues faced by our communities that make individuals, particularly children, vulnerable to trafficking in the first place. Rather than have today's program exclusively present you with the views of this office and the law enforcement community, we thought it was critical to bring a diversity of viewpoints, insights, and experiences to this important discussion. We have intentionally sought presenters with varied thoughts on the historical and current root causes of trafficking. And while these sensitive conversations are better served by in-person interactions, these issues are too important to wait. The speakers today include our partners on the front lines addressing some of the issues that create vulnerability to trafficking crime issues, such as trauma and domestic violence. Their work, the services they provide, and the awareness they create is a vital part of a holistic preventative approach. We are so pleased that Liz Williamson, a survivor and survivor advocate, will share her story with us today. Not only does her story create awareness necessary for prevention, but it also highlights areas where we as a society can come together and do better in our prevention efforts going forward. We urge you to please also stay with us for the presentation of the Sergeant Noel Hall Award. 
Sergeant Hall left behind a legacy of putting victims first and relentlessly pursuing traffickers. The Attorney General's Human Ta Trafficking Task Force honors that legacy every year by awarding a deserving law enforcement officer with the Sergeant Noel Hall Award. This year, we have the honor of presenting it to a team of four from Bergen County Prosecutor Mark Musella's office for their extraordinary work in this area. I do not want to take any more time away from this incredible program that was put together for today, but I just want to thank you all for joining us virtually. Thank you to our speakers for their important messages. Thank you to Deputy Director Taggart and the rest of the team involved in putting today's program together for their hard work. We hope that next year we will be back face-to-face -face where we can once again convene to discuss, collaborate, and stand together side-by-side -side in our resolve to end human trafficking in New Jersey. Thank you and enjoy the program. Good afternoon, my name is Liz Williamson and truly it's an honor to be here today with all of you. And it's an opportunity for me as a survivor to be able to share my voice and to be able to be heard. For so many of us that survived human trafficking, for me, it was sex trafficking. We're denied the opportunity to be heard, to be seen. And truly, I believed for a long time that I was invisible. I'm grateful through partnerships with offices like yours that that's not the case any longer. I grew up in South Jersey. I'm familiar with Wawa. I used to go to Cowtown on Saturdays with my grandma and go to the flea markets. I went down to the shore, Wildwood, Avalon, that type of thing. I still think that the East Coast has better transportation than me on the West Coast now. But my memories and my experiences in New Jersey weren't always positive. You see, I was first sold by my mom. My mom, who was a nurse, who was supposed to care for and love and protect people, didn't protect me. She worked at a local county hospital. She had all the right things to say that she would love and cherish her daughter and that she gave me a great start to life. I went to Catholic school. I had friends, I had hobbies. And to me, public health means that you prevent situations from happening in the first place. So perhaps by me sharing my story today, we'll have the opportunity to prevent, to prevent something like this happening again. My home life had turmoil. What people didn't know behind closed doors was that my mom had been a recreational drug user. She occasionally had needles and things in the house that I didn't know were bad because I didn't have a understanding as a child of what those paraphernalia meant. I would dispose of the needles in my school. Instead, my school's response was, please use the sharps container. My mom would regularly pass out from drugs. I remember it clearly. She wasn't emotionally available. My dad, he grew up in a pretty repressed Catholic family where he was sexually abused by priests. That didn't come out until much later, but it made perfect sense to me when it finally came out that he was unable to protect me because no one ever protected him. I know for my mom that perhaps if she had had intervention early on for the abuse that she suffered, she would not have chosen the same things for me. But eventually it becomes a choice and she made a choice. My family was respected, so no one asked questions. People thought, oh, they're put together, they're happy. I see them at church on Sundays. They all sit in the same pew, and we did. We were a large family. But no one asked if I was happy. No one asked if I was safe. No one asked me for my opinion of just about anything. I think they assumed because we had a family name that meant something 
that all was probably well at home because we had two college educated individuals who had decided to bring a daughter into the world. And isn't that all you really need to have a successful home life? Unfortunately, that's not all you need. So I go to this Catholic school. My family's well known. And they choose to look the other way. They see a girl that comes into school who loves to read, loves to go to ballet class. And on my report cards, they write, tells imaginative stories, talks too much. Both were probably true for me as a child. But more than that, they didn't ask the right questions. You see, because if I told a story as a child about a man's body parts, I wasn't making those up. I'm trying to be gracious in how I explain things right now, knowing that you have children, that you have people that you care about, knowing that for some of us, this issue hasn't hit us personally, and for others of us, it has. When I was six years old, my mom made a choice for me and she told me that I had to be nice, that I had to smile pretty, and I had to do whatever he asked. He was like a family uncle, where even though he's not an uncle, he is. But I grew up in the environment where if you didn't like that uncle so-and-so was coming over, your parents just told you not to wear shorts and don't wear that tiny dress. They didn't talk about the uncle's behavior. They didn't talk about what made you feel uncomfortable. They just acted like you were the problem and you had to be your own solution. So when my mom told me that I had to act pretty, smile nice, truthfully, I didn't have an idea about what I was going to go through. But interventions could have happened. Cops regularly came to my house because my parents' fighting would get out of control. Teachers knew that they were going through an ugly divorce. They knew that I was emotionally upset and overwhelmed. They knew that my parents couldn't stand each other and having them in the same room was difficult. But they didn't push too hard. They should have. But I tell this story looking back on it, knowing the steps that we could have taken. What I hope and pray for out of sharing these details instead is that you do push hard, you do ask questions, and you don't settle for an answer of, oh, we know them, it's okay. Because maybe someone could have stopped my story from ever starting or stopped my story before I got out at 23. So my mom asked me to spend time with this gentleman to do whatever he asked and to not complain. Previously, he had been giving me gifts. I didn't know that was called grooming. We didn't have words for like that. I was told to shut up, not complain, to be thankful. I was never told that your body is your own and you don't have to be bought and sold. I was never told that my voice mattered. I was never told that an adult doesn't have to have all the power. Growing up that way, I knew that I didn't have a voice and I knew that I didn't have a choice. But I also knew that sexual abuse happening at home didn't mean that if I disclosed it at school, that someone would listen. One of the strongest things I can recommend is that we teach children the correct names for bodily parts that we don't call a vagina a cookie. Because if we disclose as a child, we have a child's understanding of what happened to us. So if I said, my uncle stole my cookie, my uncle touched my cookie, my uncle hurt my cookie, maybe you just think that I'm protective 
of cookies that exist in my kitchen, you don't realize that I am talking about female anatomy and body parts. You miss an opportunity to be present to me and to be able to help. Later on, I develop an eating disorder early and self-harm behaviors. What you need to know is that these are symptoms of something much greater and much larger going on that I don't have the ability to share with you. Because my vocabulary is limited, my understanding is limited as a child, I just know that I have to punish myself because no one around me is punishing the adults for what they're doing. Instead of looking at me as the crazy girl or the too much or the I can't handle her, I wish they had said why. Ask questions, probe deeper, because I would have told you why. I wish they would have asked questions about men picking me up from school, about extended absences, instead of just brushing it off with no concern of, she's probably fine, she makes great grades. You're right, I did, because school was my safe place, but it could have been so much more. Instead, I could have had the opportunity to be set free from something that you didn't know how to name and neither did I. You see, the men that would pick me up from school, the men that would pick me up from dance class, the men that came to my dance recitals, they were the ones abusing me. They were the ones that I knew really familiar things about certain body parts that no child should ever know. But because they were respected and they had money, my opinion didn't matter. That's how it felt. That's how it still feels. In high school, I would wear long sleeves in the summertime because I didn't want people to see healed or healing scars of injuries that I afflicted on myself or that others did because I didn't know how to explain it. So instead, they probably just thought I was an angry, overwhelmed teenage girl, but they didn't look past and ask why. By the time I graduated high school in South Jersey, I didn't have a career goal or a path in life. I wanted to get away from South Jersey and go as far away as I possibly could for the simple fact that I wasn't safe, that I wasn't loved, that I wasn't valued, that I wasn't heard. But no one told me that just because you change your geographical location and you don't heal what's in here and up here, you're pretty much doomed to repeat what you went through, usually. So I moved to Florida, I go to college. In the first semester of college, I meet a man at the Tampa airport who's also going back to Philadelphia. And he says, you're so pretty, you could be a model. If I was the marrying type, I would marry you. All of the things that my heart longed to hear, that man said, and I didn't know it was a red flag. No one warned me about those indicators because no one knew what to look for. I knew he was a scumbag. That's the thing about being abused. Your scumbag indicator gets turned on pretty well. Relationships that happen in human trafficking, they're not the same trajectory as relationships in the real world. They're a lot faster. So when he said, sounds like you don't wanna go home to your mom, you could come with me. Of course I said yes. I said yes, knowing that whatever he asked me to do, I'd do it if it meant I didn't have to go home to my mom. But there was no community resource. There was no way of me saying, I don't have a safe place to live. I don't have a safe place to go back to. I had tried to ask my college and say, I don't wanna go back there. They said, sorry, we closed the dorms. This is just what you have to do. So instead, I go with him. I tell him about my hopes, my dreams, my fears. And he tells me, wow, your mom really made you into the perfect girl for me because you already know how this is gonna go. 
nothing in life is for free. And he was right. At least that's what I thought at that point. Being with him for almost four years, my childhood prepared me for that. But I went to places like the local health clinics and the county health department when I had to get STD tests. I even gave blood until they told me, have you had sex for money? When they asked me if I had had sex for money, I realized, yeah, I have. But does that mean that my blood's not good enough? That was a barrier for me because I suddenly realized that what I went through wasn't normal. And that if the health department was asking me, then maybe it was something that I wasn't supposed to be doing. It was kind of a light bulb moment for me. When I got out of human trafficking, it was because I chose to get out. I'm one of the lucky ones. But when I got out, I realized I can't go home. And just because I have a bachelor's degree now doesn't mean I know how to do life. It doesn't mean that I have the community support or the structure or the know-how to live a normal life. I'm happy to say that that was 11 years ago. I'm happy to say that I've made a life for myself, that I've gotten married, that life is good. But I truly believe that my story had many opportunities for intersection. I talked with hospital staff, I talked with counselors, I talked with lay persons, I talked with clergy. I had opportunities for people to make a difference. And so I hope today that we look at this from all the root problems that stem into, I'm willing to sell my child. And that we make a concentrated effort to have that child have safe places where this doesn't have to be their story until they're 23. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I am McKinney Chisholm Straker. For 16 plus years, I have been in the anti-trafficking movement as a clinician, a researcher, and a public health specialist. I'm honored that Coordinator Freeze invited me to speak today and to share what I've learned so far in the movement. Before we get to the meat of the presentation, uh, I want you to know that I have grant funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I'm a consultant for the Department of Health and Human Services as a NITAC consultant. And I'll be talking about one of the textbooks that I co-edited, The Historical Roots of Human Trafficking. The proceeds of this textbook go to Brown University Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. By the end of the short time we have together, I hope that folks will be able to differentiate between primary prevention and intervention, name at least three contextual determinants of human trafficking, give at least two examples of US policies that have created vulnerability to trafficking, and give at least two examples of how policies can decrease precarity. In late 2015, the American Public Health Association named human trafficking as a public health problem. And since then, the anti-trafficking movement paradigm has expanded to attempt to use public health principles in the anti-trafficking movement. And while the flag or the mantle has been taken up by the anti-trafficking movement, many actors in the movement don't actually know what that means. Uh, so what I'd like to do is talk about the foundation of public health, our approach to prevention. At the top of the triangle, we have tertiary prevention, which focuses on mitigating the fallout um, trying to prevent the negative sequelae that happen after the thing that we ideally wouldn't have had happen has happened. In the anti-trafficking movement, one of the ways this manifests is increased efforts to recognize trafficking survivors in healthcare settings. This report or this article talks about our tool RAFT or Rapid Appraisal for Trafficking, which is the first screening tool that is validated for the recognition of labor and sex trafficking among a healthcare population. But like prosecution of traffickers, RAFT will not prevent trafficking. RAFT aims to improve our chances of recognizing trafficking and not miss the opportunity to connect folks to services or offer them that connection to services. When we think about secondary prevention, that's us really focusing on risk factors or early intervention. 
in the anti-trafficking movement, we have a hyper focus on characteristics and experiences of trafficking survivors as ways that we think about mitigating the fallout of trafficking. So we have lots of literature that shows that children with a history or people with a history of child maltreatment or system involvement are at higher risk of experiencing trafficking at some point in their lives. In this study with Covenant House, New Jersey, we found that undomiciled young adults who were seeking services who had a history of an individualized education plan or a 504 program were more likely to experience trafficking than others. And that those who had a self-defined supportive adult in their life were less likely to experience trafficking. But studies like this and our, and our general anti-trafficking focus or secondary prevention efforts in the anti-trafficking movement point to who systems, institutions, and policies don't support. We focus on these individuals in an attempt to compensate for the way that systems and policies function. It doesn't actually address the manufactured vulnerabilities, it doesn't prevent those things. We're trying to cope with systems essentially at an individual level by telling folks how to recognize danger signs and where to get help, for example. A primary prevention approach looks at what lies beneath even that and is interested in, even before the vulnerability, what, what was the cause of precarity? A public health principled anti-trafficking movement requires, of course, all of these levels, tertiary, secondary, and primary prevention. But tertiary and secondary prevention are harm reduction responses. It's really, that's a trafficking response action, not an anti-trafficking or prevention, the way that you know a seventh grader would understand the term prevention. Primary prevention of trafficking focuses on the vulnerabilities that systematic and systemic marginalization and institutionalized commodification make possible. And it recognizes that if we don't change those systems and those policies, trafficking is a natural, predictable phenomenon that we should expect. In the textbook that we co-edited, Kat Chan and I put together this iceberg figure that I think most folks are familiar with the iceberg metaphor, right? At the top of the, above the surface, the tip of the iceberg, we have folks that are sick, hurt, or dying, and folks that are healthy, happy, and thriving in various combinations thereof throughout the life course or cycle. But below the surface is what holds that up. These are the origins that create precarity as John Chang and Kim Chang talk about in chapter 10 of our textbook. They reference Judith Butler's use of the term and contextualize it for an understanding of primary prevention of trafficking. Here we recognize that it is the lower parts, the contextual determinants of trafficking of uh, our communities that institutionalize precarity that make trafficking possible. So as we look at the triangle of the public health approach to prevent, of prevention and the iceberg together, we get a very busy slide, but it helps you understand where these things map onto each other. So secondary and tertiary prevention map onto our distal and proximal determinants, the higher parts of the iceberg. Primary prevention is focused at our, con our contextual uh, determinants, lower that are more foundational to our society. Anti-trafficking work, if we're going to do primary prevention, has to focus here. So I'm going to offer two examples uh, in our short time that we have together, and they may be uncomfortable, quite frankly. But in the words of attorney Jennifer Lamour, don't feel called out, feel called in. In our first example, we will talk about the manifestation of colonialism and, and imperialism and institutionalized racism or white supremacy. These are things that contribute or factors that contribute to precarity to people for people of color, especially such that we see people of color are disproportionately trafficked in the United States. So we'll start off with a photo from the 1800s of native children who were forcibly removed from their families and put into government and church run boarding schools. Indian boarding schools were a tool of cultural genocide and had the expressed intent of quote unquote, killing the Indian and saving the man. We see folks here that I read as boys have their hair cut to conform to white expectations of masculinity. Children who survived boarding schools survived violence and starvation as punishment for doing completely natural things like speaking the language they grew up speaking, 
praying their prayers, making their ceremony. They endured physical and sexual abuse from their educators, their teachers, and their school administrators. And those who didn't survive, they died. Uh, and so we see some schools have cemeteries that abut the school grounds or school campuses. Mike Panay is an Indian boarding school survivor and he says, it was the worst 10 years of my life. I was away from my family from the age of six to 16. How do you learn about family? I didn't know what love was. We weren't even known by names back then. I was a number. Do you remember your number? 73. When we think about childhood development, we recognize toxic stress or trauma that is unmitigated by caring adults primes a child or a person for an experience of trafficking. Indian boarding schools, which existed from the 17th to the 20th century, were toxic stress. They primed Native folks to experience trafficking. And so we see that Native people are disproportionately represented among those who survive trafficking in the United States. It wasn't until 1978 with the Indian Child Welfare Act that Indian parents, their right to refuse to send their children to these schools was recognized. We start to see closures of these schools in the 1980s and 1990s. Some of the schools were taken over by tribes, but overall Indian boarding schools continue to have negative impacts, impacts that bleed into generations. And again, very much within living memory. If you can see the screen here, uh, Mike Panay was in a boarding school from 1953 to 1963, very much within living memory. Now this is a narrative that is specific to uh, indigenous populations on Turtle Island, but overall the erasure of true history and people of color and women from common core curriculum. I mean, it's no wonder that children of color are dropping out of schools, mainstream schools in the United States. There are of course other factors, but a major factor is that we're not even in the curriculum anyway. We don't see ourselves. Frederick Douglass said that it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken people. And in the spirit of that quote, I wanna highlight the Wampanoag Language Reclamation, Reclamation Project that is discussed in chapter 16 of our textbook by authors Natana Hicks, Green Deer, and Jennifer Weston. In the Wampanoag Language Reclamation Project, Wampanoag children are taught in their language and they're taught by, they're educated by teachers and their community members. And this is an, a traditional way that indigenous children are educated. It's also traditionally how all children are educated so that they learn to value themselves and others and the land that they live on and are responsible for and history in its comprehensiveness. And they learn to value their own potential. This is what I would wish for all children everywhere so that each child knows that they are loved and they are strong. In our second example, we discuss the intersection of the criminal justice system, racism, and capitalism. Now, here we see that in New Jersey, people of color are disproportionately represented among the incarcerated, but New Jersey is not special. Rather, it is emblematic of incarceration across the United States. Folks on the call or on the webinar will recognize, of course, that people of color are not inherently criminal, but we are criminalized. When I hear conversations about criminal justice reform, sometimes I cringe because I hear this refrain a lot that the criminal justice system is failing communities of color. And I cringe because the criminal justice system is doing exactly what it was designed and intended to do. It was designed to incarcerate people of color. That was its purpose. In, with, the, with the 13th Amendment and the abolition of slavery, we left a loophole to allow for incarceration to continue actually. So the civil war for the Southern slave owners was not about the morality of race-based slavery, but about the merits of an enslaved workforce over a free labor market. After losing the war, Southern slave owners weren't suddenly on board with free labor market. So the 13th amendment allows for incarcerated labor. Overall, it is illegal in this country to for slavery to exist, but incarcerated labor can be used for free or for extremely cheap. And so we see the mushrooming of chain gangs across the United States, especially in the South and the West. If you Google the term chain gang, you will find the same thing that I found, which is this photo and photos like it. 
with people that I read as Black and people that I read as men and boys. With the 13th Amendment's loophole, we see the creation of crimes like loitering and panhandling so that folks could be arrested. Essentially, it was illegal to be unemployed. These white slave owners or former slave owners weren't going to hire people that yesterday they weren't paying. So we created these crimes. It was illegal to loiter or panhandle. What else are you gonna do when you're unemployed? Now you're arrested. Now your labor can be used for free or for cheap. So the criminal justice system in the United States is rooted in capitalism and racism, yes, but it actually goes even beyond slavery, uh, beyond the abolition of slavery into slavery with the capture of runaway slaves and returning them, like we see with the Texas, the Texas uh, Rangers and the Ku Klux Klan. The majority of crimes in the United States are nonviolent. In fact, 4.5% of arrests are for violent crimes. Everything else, all the other incarcerations are for manufactured crimes, crimes of poverty, crimes of morality. The sentences then that people are serving, disproportionately people of color are serving, are for these nonviolent crimes. And they continue to serve their sentence even after they've served their sentence. We see perpetual punishment of people of color, especially who have an incarceration history. So with the caveat that on this slide, we see a false dichotomy of race with black and white races only represented, um, reflecting how a lot of criminal justice, uh, criminal ju justice jurisdictions collect race uh, information. And then we see the false paradigm of the false gender binary of men and women. But setting that aside, we see that in the general population, unemployment is at 48%. In the post-incarceration population, it's 18 to 44%. We have 70 million people incarcerated and 700,000 people returning annually to the same communities, frankly, that they came from with still no resources and the same problems that they left. So we have to talk about restorative justice instead of thinking about continuing to do the same things that we have been doing and hoping that there is somehow gonna magically be different. Right, so restorative justice challenges the concept of incarceration because it recognizes the overwhelming harm that incarceration does in comparison to any good. Restorative justice recognizes, we should recognize that we are not functioning in a restorative justice system at this point. Our system splits people into victims and perpetrators, which is a false mythology, right? It's never just as simple as black, white, or victim perpetrator, we have to address these underlying causes. Because we don't do that and we incarcerate and then send people back into the same communities with the same resources, which are next to nil, and the same problems, we see that you know, we continue to have things like uh, people being perpetually punished wherein they can't get a job. If you can't get a job, how do you eat? Where do you live? Housing applications have the conviction question as well. And so if people are forced into an underground economy. Therefore, we see 68 to 70% recidivism rate in this country because survival is a human instinct. And when you have limited opportunities, also known as precarity, you're vulnerable to exploitation. On the other hand, we have restorative justice principles and possibilities that we're starting to move towards with things like the ban the box movement. This, however, is secondary prevention, right? It's harm reduction. The idea of saying, we're not gonna ask this question or we're gonna ask it later in the hiring process doesn't completely eliminate the problem, but it starts to get closer to recognizing that we have to do better, we can do better. Restorative justice is, I wanna emphasize, not some pie in the sky idea, it is actually rooted in traditions of people of color, historically, and is being enacted in countries around the world, including Finland and Norway, which admittedly are very different, are, for example, very homogenous countries in comparison. But it's also happening in this country. Um, we can look at Los Angeles as an example, where we see that they're thinking about how do we come up with alternatives to incarceration so that we're not having police respond to things that aren't really police issues, for example. It is important though, as we're thinking about these, these criminal justice reforms or restorative justice, that what works in Norway won't work in the United States. What works in Los Angeles might not work in New Jersey, but we can 
look at these models for examples and adapt. We should also recognize that what works in one part of New Jersey in Newark or Trenton may not work in AC or in Freehold. So we have to think smaller and recognize that communities have answers. Communities know how to solve their problems. And at a state level, even that is too diverse potentially for us to come up with a one size fits all. Additionally, we need to recognize that as we come back to this public health approach to prevention and recognize the whole triangle, we have to do these things, these primary prevention efforts in conjunction with our trafficking responses. Primary prevention of trafficking, anti true anti-trafficking action takes years and generations to manifest. These are things that we can call anti-trafficking, but we don't actually need to use the word trafficking when we're thinking about changing policies and systems. We're trying to change the policies and systems of the criminal justice system. The, we're trying to root out racism in, our, in an institutionalized way in, for example, our housing practices and things like redlining, right, in our voting rights. This is, this is anti-trafficking work. We have to, however, have a trafficking response because it will take years. And so we need to be able to mitigate that fallout in the meantime. In order to do both of these things responsibly, we need to recognize that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. This is a quote from Audre Lorde. That essentially means we can't work as tools within our systems of child welfare or uh, the criminal justice system or in education or in healthcare and think that that's enough and that trying to make change within the system will work. We need folks who are outside of these systems but are impacted by these systems. We need folks from the community and folks with lived experience to be a part of these conversations, a big part, the major part, their experiences need to be centered. Because we're short on time and because unfortunately this webinar isn't set up for us to have a Q&A and a conversation, I offer my email. Folks should feel free to reach out so that we can continue this dialogue. It is a challenging conversation to have, but again, I think if we're going to engage in anti-trafficking work, if we're going to call ourselves anti-trafficking actors, we have to do the harder work of not just responding to trafficking, but preventing precarity. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Assistant Attorney General Anne-Marie Taggart, and I wanted to just take a minute to thank our first two speakers who shed light on the root causes of trafficking, Liz from a personal perspective and the doctor from a historical perspective. One underlying theme you may notice is that how addressing the adverse issues that continue to face our communities can and will make a difference. Issues such as addiction, trauma, racism, mental health. Therefore, we are grateful for our next two presenters who will highlight their programs and describe the resources they provide to address these and other deep-rooted issues in our communities. These speakers offer us a glimpse into positive community-driven change that is so important and necessary to prevent vulnerability to trafficking at the onset. We invite you to be inspired and to see how all stakeholders in the community can play a role in the prevention of human trafficking. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for this year's Human Trafficking Conference. My name is Anna Jones. I'm the Community Partnerships Manager at HopeWorks in Camden City. And I'm going to talk to you about HopeWorks and what we do and why we do it. So although human trafficking to reduce and eliminate human trafficking is not a part of our mission and vision, it is our civic duty to work to reduce and ultimately eliminate on a daily basis. So it's not directly tied to what we do, but inherently the work that we're doing with reducing poverty also reduces human trafficking. So I'm gonna spend some time talking about what HopeWorks is, what we do at HopeWorks, who we are at HopeWorks, what our roles are, and most importantly, the young professionals that we work with at HopeWorks and how we're able to impact their lives on a daily basis. HopeWorks is a trauma-informed organization, which I'll speak to a little bit about as well. Um, and it plays a huge part in how we work with our young people, how we communicate with our young people, but ultimately helps what we're all here to talk about today, and that's to reduce human trafficking. 
So what is HopeWorks? HopeWorks provides a positive healing atmosphere that propels young people to build strong futures and break through the cycle of violence and poverty in Camden City, New Jersey. So I say Camden City, New Jersey, but we have been able to make an impact so much greater than the city of Camden, so much greater than the city of Philadelphia. And most of this happened during the pandemic, which is something I'm proud of. Um, I would say we have been able to touch uh, about four or five different counties in the state of New Jersey, and we're rapidly growing and spreading throughout Pennsylvania and Philadelphia on a daily basis. Um, so we connect youth with life-changing opportunities where they're growing technology skills to work for enterprising businesses within our community. The real world on the job experience they gain adds to their potential and benefits in our, part, our partners in a tremendous way. So how do we do this, right? So HopeWorks is not a typical nonprofit. So we're a combination of a nonprofit organization and a social enterprise. So we have three businesses, which I'll speak to in a minute, but each of those businesses employ our young professionals from our training program and any money that we get or we earn from our businesses and jobs that we have throughout the, the city, the state and the country goes back to employing these individuals, which ultimately is the way that we reduce poverty. So those three businesses that we have are our youth healing team, our web department and our GIS department. So our, our, I'll speak to our web department first. So they build quality, stellar websites for so many different organizations across the state of New Jersey, across the state of Pennsylvania and beyond. So what you get from our web team and the services that you get from our web team are extremely professional. They're not just websites that are put together by kids who think that they know how to do tech our young professionals do tech, right? So this is what they do. This is what they train to do. This is what their skills are. This is what their passions are. So our young professionals build websites, code websites from start to finish and really bring their clients' visions and dreams into life. Then we have our GIS department. So they do geographical maps and map so many different things across the country. They've been able to really impact um, so many different states through American water and tracking water and population in different areas and urban areas. And some other things that they've been able to do um, are just create basic maps that impact the city of Camden and help the residents of the city figure out how close the local grocery store is or how far do I have to travel in order to get to fresh food. The last um, internal business that we have is our youth healing team. So the youth healing team is a group of young professionals that are trained in trauma-informed care, the real deal. These individuals are beyond trauma-informed. They are the advocates for young people, for any individual who've experienced any array of trauma, whether that's a small trauma or a life-changing trauma, regardless of what it is. They are trained on three different levels on how to work and love and be around individuals who've experienced trauma. And then they take all of these skills that they learned and they take all of these carefully curated skills and teach back. They have opportunities to teach individuals in schools, in universities, in tech companies, CEOs, principals, um, staff, nurses on how to be trauma-informed and how to work with individuals who've experienced trauma. So the way that you communicate with an individual who experienced trauma needs to come from a place of compassion. And our youth healing team ensures that any individual they train understands that and can move in that way post their trainings. So step one is our paid training. Our young professionals come through our door and unlike many other training programs in our area, they're paid to do the work. So they get paid a daily stipend for just showing up and just coming to be present and coming to change your life. And then they get paid based on the modules that they complete. So our training program is comprised of a series of modules with different price amounts. And what we like to think of it as is you get your daily uh, fee for being at HopeWorks, but then you get a 
bonus on top for every module that you complete. We do this in, in many different ways. So the first reason is we don't want individuals to rush through our training program just for payment, right? That doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel like a trauma-informed way to do things where a young professional can only eat at night if they successfully complete a module that day or that week or during that two-week time period. The second thing is we understand that our individuals are coming from places where they have to feed themselves, feed, them fa feed their families, um, work to provide for their families. And so that way we're truly preparing them for life after Hope Works by giving them enough money to get to work, to pay for their meals, to budget, to plan for their futures. And then once they complete their paid training, which is a typical six to eight week time period, it's a self-paced training program, they then move into a paid internship. So those three businesses that I just mentioned, our young professionals are able to apply to work in any of our business departments. And then from there, they're working on a part-time basis and they're earning money, real money. <laughs> they're able to earn above minimum wage, which um, is something that we also want to get our young professionals in the habit of earning more because they deserve more. And the quality of work that they're producing deserves more than minimum wage. And every individual that comes through our training program and into our internship, they're in their internship um, on average around six months. So they have six months of on the job training in our office. And then from there, the last and final step is referring them to our employment partners. So while we're working in our employment partners, we have very high expectations for those, those individuals that are employing our young professionals. So we have the expectation that one, you're gonna treat them just as good as we have. Two, you're gonna honor them and see all of the amazing skills and talents that they've brought to your organization and your company. Three, you're going to pay them what they deserve to be paid. So in order for us to count it as success, excuse me, we have to have these individuals making more than $36,000 a year. And then fourth, we have the expectation that you're gonna to continue to grow and develop them that way they can continue to move up the ladder. So what we also realized was we can train our young professionals on how to be great individuals in the tech field, how to use all these amazing skills but if we're not able to give them some of the basic, basic supports, excuse me, then all of this is, is not going to be included in the holistic approach that we wanna take here. So sometimes we have individuals who've come to HopeWorks and haven't finished high school, which is okay. So we have an adult basic skills program, which I'll refer to as ABS. In our ABS program, our young professional students are able to enroll in classes at HopeWorks receive those training in those classes in our HopeWorks building. And then HopeWorks will prepare them for what New Jersey calls the high set test. HopeWorks will then pay for their high set test and then they'll graduate with a high school diploma. So this will be just as equivalent if they would have finished their um, traditional high school program or high school, um, their local high school. Next, we have our career readiness department. So these are the individuals who are essentially HR for our young professionals. They are with them every step of the way. Day one of starting HopeWorks for a young professional, all the way to post um, employment and supporting them with whatever future goals they have at that time. They're setting them up for success with dressing for success. They're setting them up for success with resume building. They're putting them in front of potential employers doing mock interviews who are really building their skills and getting them job ready and getting them interview ready. And then most of the time, they're so impressed with the young professional that they either want to do more for HopeWorks or offer that young professional a job. We've had several instances where a mock interview has turned into a real interview real quick. And those young professionals have walked away with a promised job, which is always rewarding for all of us. And it's something we all get to celebrate in. Next, we have our college success coaching. Um, so sometimes a young professional will come in and say, I want to go to college. And it's a goal that I have. I just don't know how to pay for it. And with our college success coaching and our college success program, we have two options where HopeWorks can either pay for a two-year degree at a community college, 
or roll that money over for a four-year program and pay for some additional college expenses. All of us here know how much textbooks have cost, so I could have used something like this during that time. But HopeWorks is able to support those individuals through a time where so many college students are so unsure on how to continue paying for their education. And one last department is the department that I spoke to in the beginning, which is the resource department. So we have key partnerships that we build that give our young professionals essentially VIP treatment and VIP services. So one big one that we use is our mental health counseling services and mental health counseling partnerships. So our young professionals do not wait on a waiting list when they've identified themselves as wanting to receive mental health treatment. Same thing with individuals who are housing secure. Um, typically in our city, in our county, the turnaround time for housing insecurity placement is about three to five business days. For HopeWorks, it's about 45 minutes through our partners. And from there, we're making sure they're placed in safe and secure housing. We're monitoring their stay during their entire time and making sure that they know they're not alone. So we do all of this with using the trauma-informed care and the trauma-informed model. So we can give individuals every tip that they need to be successful. We can dress them for success, we can pay them, we can put them in front of the individuals who are going to hire them. But if we aren't taking their trauma into consideration, then we are doing them a disservice. What we have to do and what we realize every organization needs to do is to one, look at an individual's life experiences. How have, has your life experience impact you and your behavior and who you are standing in front of me today? So in no way are we looking at an individual as their trauma and we're not looking at them as if an individual who's experienced so much trauma and is traumatized, but we're using their trauma to help create better goals for them. And with that in mind, talking to them in a, a different way. Um, walking with them in a different way, giving them the skills that they need in a way where they can receive them based on the way that their trauma has impacted them. And we do all of this with the intent to support our young professionals post hope works. So these trauma-informed skills and these trauma-informed ways of life that we really have, have groomed ourselves on being um, is something that are to be carried with our individuals as they transition into employment and beyond employment, which also ties into human trafficking. So as all of us here know, human trafficking is something that has impacted our city and our state for years and years. And by using a trauma-informed care model, we're able to see these individuals as individuals who have experienced trauma, but are not damaged. And these individuals are capable of achieving great things and capable of success as long as they're receiving the support that they need. And that's what we do at HelpWorks. So thank you all so much for joining me this afternoon. Thank you for learning about HopeWorks and learning about how we try to combat this issue. And I hope to connect with any of you. If anybody has questions about HopeWorks or would like to get involved with HopeWorks, I'll be happy to pass around my information. I'd love to connect over email or phone. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Hello everyone, I'm honored to be here with you all in recognition of Human Trafficking Awareness Month. My name is Sierra Hart and I am the Director of Housing and Economic Justice at the New Jersey Coalition to End Domestic Violence, also known as NJCEDV. NJCDV is a statewide coalition representing 30 direct service programs across New Jersey. We work to fulfill our mission to end domestic violence through advocacy, training, technical assistance, and raising public awareness about domestic violence and the ways we can work together to enhance our responses and prevent domestic violence in New Jersey, stopping it before it starts. Violence is a leading worldwide public health crisis. Human trafficking and domestic violence are two forms of violence that have been exacerbated during the current public health crisis. Domestic violence can be defined as a pattern of abusive behavior that is used to maintain power and control over another. For educational purposes, a victim of domestic violence is any person who is 18 years of age or older or who is an emancipated minor and who has been subjected to domestic violence by a partner, former partner, or any other person 
who is a present household member or was at any time a household member. A victim of domestic violence also includes any person, regardless of age, who has been subjected to domestic violence by a person with whom the victim has a child in common or with whom the victim anticipates having a child in common if one of the parties is pregnant. The definition of victim of domestic violence also includes any person who has been subjected to domestic violence by a person with whom the victim has had a dating relationship. Dating violence is violence and abuse committed by a person to exert power and control over a current or former dating partner. Domestic and dating violence can include physical, sexual, emotional, economic, or psychological actions or threats of actions. This includes any behavior that intimidates, manipulates, humiliates, isolates, frightens, terrorizes, coerces, threatens, hurts, injures, or harms someone. I also want to raise awareness about digital abuse, which is the use of technology, such as phones, social media, and messaging to intimidate, harass, threaten, or isolate a survivor or victim. We know that human trafficking involves a trafficker using force, fraud, or coercion to control victims for the purpose of engaging in commercial sex acts or labor services against their will. Domestic violence and human trafficking can involve patterns of escalating violence and abuse over a period of time. Survivors often experience multiple forms of abuse. By acknowledging the intersection of domestic violence and human trafficking, we can begin to recognize how complex patterns of abusive behavior create environments that enable and perpetuate violence. Domestic violence and human trafficking do not discriminate. Human trafficking and domestic violence are exacerbated epidemics within this current health pandemic affecting individuals in every community, regardless of age, economic status, sexual orientation, gender, race, religion, ability, or nationality. The devastating physical, emotional, and psychological impacts of domestic violence and human trafficking can cross generations and last a lifetime. We know that the chronic stress caused by domestic violence and human trafficking is linked to higher rates of chronic diseases. Everyone knows someone. One in four women and one in seven men will have experienced domestic violence within their lifetime. According to the International Labor Organization, it is estimated that there are 40.3 million victims of human trafficking globally, with hundreds of thousands in the United States. It's in our backyard. We must recognize and respond to domestic violence and human trafficking to ultimately reduce and end these occurrences of violence. We must address these public health issues from a public health approach. Domestic violence and human trafficking impacts all of us, and all of us must be a part of the solution. So what is it that we can do to address the root causes of human trafficking and domestic violence and truly work to end violence for all? Ending dating violence, domestic violence, and human trafficking is only possible when all people are free from oppression, injustice, and violence. First, we need to understand the problem. Domestic violence and human trafficking are two of the greatest human rights and health challenges we face. We can't continue to normalize violence. All communities are impacted by domestic violence and human trafficking. Domestic violence and human trafficking is rooted in systemic oppressions, including but not limited to institutional and systemic racism and violence. System oppression limits survivors' access to supportive and holistic services, advocacy, information, and resources that could help survivors and victim victims ultimately live lives free of violence poverty and oppression can create an environment where domestic violence and human trafficking and other forms of violence can thrive. We can't address human trafficking and domestic violence without focusing on justice for all. According to a survey conducted by United Way, 61% of human trafficking survivors surveyed said that racism made them more vulnerable to trafficking. According to a survey by the United States Department of Health and Human Services, 55.7% of all labor trafficking survivors are from the Latinx community, and 40.4% of all sex trafficking survivors identify as African American or Black, and 14.8% of all labor trafficking survivors are Asian American. Worldwide, Indigenous people are at a higher risk 
of human trafficking, including both sex and labor trafficking. According to one youth study, LGBTQIA plus homeless youth are twice as likely to experience labor and or sex trafficking compared to homeless youth who do not identify as LGBTQIA plus. Human trafficking and domestic violence are complex problems that require multiple interventions. We need to center the voices and experiences of survivors, particularly survivors who are most marginalized. We must have interventions and resources that are survivor-centered and allow survivors the agency to lead as they navigate their journey to living lives free of violence. Community responses can be key to ending violence for all. Justice, accountability, healing, safety, and security looks different for every survivor. There isn't a one-size-fits-all approach to serving survivors. Survivors are often isolated, so there is a true need for opportunities for connection and support within their communities. We can help ensure that survivors are recognized and connected to the resources they need to get the help they deserve. We know that survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking need to be able to access equitable services. We know survivors need access to transportation, childcare, flexible funding, cash assistance, employment opportunities, job training, legal advocacy, counseling, mental health services, housing, access to re-entry services, and so much more. We need to continue to build out technical assistance and financial resources for communities. We need to continue to advocate for equitable programs, policies, and practices. And we need to continue to educate, coordinate, empower, and mobilize our communities to end these public health crises. We need to see, hear, and learn from survivors in our communities. We need to find innovative ways to connect with one another. Communities need tools to identify and mitigate domestic violence and human trafficking. We must continue to meet survivors and victims where they are at. There are so many opportunities to learn from one another right inside of your community. We need to continue to work to heal our communities. This is truly ongoing social justice work. I encourage each and every one of you to find out what you can do to serve your community. What can you do with what you have to serve survivors in your community right now? As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, everybody can be great because everybody can serve. What are you doing to serve survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking in your community? Let's focus our efforts on prevention in addition to intervention after the violence has occurred. Seek out educational opportunities to learn about domestic violence and human trafficking and the intersections of violence truly looking beneath what you see on the surface. Use social media to educate and engage communities, work to change our culture by educating men and changing the culture of sexualization of minors, learning alongside each other, educating our children, educating parents and guardians, teachers and community members who engage with children in our communities so that we can continue to reduce the number of people who are vulnerable to exploitation, Justice can only be achieved when all survivors have autonomy to exercise their human rights and have access to information and resources. Let's focus on mobilizing to help survivors heal by healing our communities and promoting wellness. We have a responsibility to advocate for all survivors, particularly survivors from marginalized communities. Discrimination, disparities, and inequities on a personal and institutional level continue to perpetuate domestic violence and human trafficking. Individuals who experience poverty and oppression are more likely to be to experience domestic violence, dating violence, and human trafficking. Addressing racial inequities and health disparities that exist can reduce instances of violence and help survivors live lives free of violence. We are on a mission to empower people in their communities to understand and respond to domestic violence and human trafficking and understand the systemic conditions that perpetuate violence. One life impacted by domestic violence and or human trafficking is one life too many. Let's continue to work together to end domestic violence and human trafficking and support survivors in their healing journey so they can not only survive, but thrive. 
to learn more about the New Jersey Coalition to End Domestic Violence and the member programs that serve individuals, children, and families impacted by domestic violence, please visit our website at www.njcedb.org. Let's collaborate. Thank you for your time. The New Jersey Department of Education cares deeply about the well being and safety of our 1.4 million students and has supported efforts to build awareness of human trafficking within schools for some time now. With this month being Human Trafficking Prevention Month, I'm thrilled to be able to join today's event to share an exciting and timely announcement. This past Wednesday, the New Jersey Department of Education, in collaboration with the New Jersey Office of the Attorney General and the New Jersey Department of Children and Families, released the Guidelines for Schools on the Prevention of Human Trafficking. This comprehensive document was created in consultation with the stakeholder group, comprised of representatives spanning the fields of education, law enforcement, and healthcare, as well as prevention partners, service providers, and a lived experience expert. It will help pave the way for schools throughout New Jersey to raise awareness of human trafficking and thereby aid in its prevention. With easy to navigate sections, a provision of resources, a quick reference sheet, and more, this guide can be utilized and adapted as needed by school staff. Additionally, with the human trafficking of children being recognized as a form of child abuse and neglect, these guidelines also encourage schools to think about policies and procedures for how best to respond to suspected instances utilizing a trauma-informed lens and student-centered approach. As we look at the work of New Jersey's statewide action plan on ACEs, these guidelines are another tool to aid in addressing adverse childhood experiences here in New Jersey. The release of these guidelines is a pivotal step forward in this work, and we look forward to continuing to support school staff in developing their own knowledge of human trafficking, as well as in providing critical prevention programming for students. For five years, the New Jersey Attorney General's Task Force on Human Trafficking has been awarding the Sergeant Noel Hall Award to law enforcement officers who go above and beyond to investigate human trafficking cases and serve human trafficking victims. Sergeant Hall was a DCJ detective assigned to the Human Trafficking Unit. Under her leadership, DCJ investigated and prosecuted the first human trafficking case in the state. Sergeant Hall was instrumental in forming relationships with stakeholders to ensure victims receive services and work collaboratively with outside agencies to investigate human trafficking in the state. She became an expert in the field and was well respected for that expertise. Having had the fortunate experience of working with Sergeant Hall, I am so pleased that her dedication to human trafficking victims and her spirit of resilience continues in law enforcement officers across the state. This year, we honor that spirit by awarding the Sergeant Noel Hall Award to members of the Bergen County Prosecutor's Office. Job well done. Congratulations. Hi, I'm Chief Jason Love of the Bergen County Prosecutor's Office. Today, I'm pleased to present members of my office with the Sergeant Noel Hall Award in recognition of their work to prevent human trafficking. This award, which is given to us by the Attorney General's Office, reads as such in recognition of your tireless efforts and unwavering dedication to combat human trafficking in the state of New Jersey, we are proud to present the Sergeant Noel Hall Award to Assistant Prosecutor Catherine Cobb, Lieutenant Jennifer Ueda, Detective Walter Kunka, and Sergeant Chris Lewicki. On behalf of Prosecutor Musella, Chief Love, Captain Barzalotto, Lieutenant Ueda, Sergeant Lewicki, Detective Kunka, and I, we would like to express a sincere thank you to the Attorney General's Office and the Attorney General's Task Force on Human Trafficking, and specifically to Deputy Director Anne Marie Taggart, whose guidance and experience was invaluable to the success of this investigation. When we started this investigation in November 2020, none of us had a huge understanding of the human trafficking world. Over the course of four months, I had the pleasure of working with some of the most hardworking, dedicated and smartest members of our office to ultimately arrest over 20 individuals. These criminals were involved in a large scale prostitution ring, profiting off of innocent women illegally trafficked to the United States and forced to work in the sex trade. This investigation quickly became a large scale, logistically challenging investigation. However, the work ethic and commitment of the people that I stand here with today is what made it so successful. 
I speak for all of us when I say that the pride we all feel knowing we made a difference in the lives of many victims is why we do the job that we do. Thank you again for this honor. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Thank you to our speakers and to our award recipients. Thank you, General Brock and Director Rotolo for your support. We believe the discussion today was an important one and we hope you valued the program as well. Finally, thank you to all the stakeholders out there, the child welfare community, healthcare workers, law enforcement officers, victim advocacy groups, social workers, educators, and first responders. As a community, we will continue to evolve, to grow, and to work together in the prevention of human trafficking. We look forward to working with you in 2022.